So thank you all for joining us today. Um, it is you know, my pleasure to moderate this session. One of our first major projects at CT Data was to build a more robust business search function um, for the Secretary of the State, which we did in 2015. Um, and then from there, we built many other business data exploration tools. We actually um, still host the NAICS, and you called it NIC, NICS, right? NAICS, yeah, I was. Yeah, I wasn't sure. It's like, I have it wrong all these years. Um, so for the Secretary of State, so when businesses register online, they have to go in and they have to pick an industry in NAICS code, um, which is a super challenge, which Natalie pointed out earlier. But so um, it is something that is um, near and dear to my heart because I've been looking at Connecticut business data for years. And so this is very exciting that we're coming together around business data. Um, and throughout the years that we've worked on this, we continually run up against many data gaps that would limit what questions we can answer with the data. The limitations are partly due to statutory limitations on what SOTs can collect, because it's written in statute what they can collect. So there are challenges of what gets collected and then what doesn't. Um, another challenge that we're going to be talking Another challenge of the data is that it's administrative data, so it's not collected for the purposes of answering policy questions. So in 2018, after repeatedly being asked questions, SOTS being asked questions about, you know, how many black businesses um, exist in the state, how many are veteran-owned, minority-owned, they decided to implement a survey. Um, and so that survey has allowed us to collect some of the data. However, because it's, in, it's not in statute, it's optional. Um, so that presents another challenge, which we'll learn about today. So when we started dis our discussions with the Blackwell Data Center, we jumped at the opportunity and the, ex and, and the excitement on the behalf of Blackwell Data Center to explore business data and to see, as Natalie talked about earlier today, collecting data from the local level. Um, and so we worked on a project together, and Jason, is Jason Chung from my team is going to present on the question that we tried to answer, how many black-owned businesses exist in the state? Um, and so you'll be, it w it's a very exciting presentation because it's, because <laughs> it presents all the challenges that we've talked about today. So, and then we're gonna hear from our panel of experts who are trying to improve the possibilities for black-owned businesses, and they'll also share the obstacles that we face when we don't have the data we need. So we have with us today, again, and we're very happy, Natalie Evans-Harris, Executive Director of Blackwell Data Center is part of the panel. <laughs> we have, um, and I'll go, and we have Harry Amadison, the Manager of Data Analytics and Quality Improvement from the Village for Children and Families, but here today um, participating as on the leadership board of Shop Black Connecticut. And then we have Oni, o Obiacha, sorry, yes, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, he's executive director of CT Next, and then I also have Jason Chung, senior data analyst at CT Data. So thank you all. Um, so we're gonna start off, kick this off, and full bios and um, on our speakers, are, you can use the QR code and read them on our um, online um, conference page. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jason, and he's gonna present about business data in Connecticut. Thanks, Michelle. All right, so I just want to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, this is my first in-person conference for CT Data because we weren't doing them in person uh, during the pandemic. So it's great to finally meet a lot of you that I've only met virtually. Um, so yeah, thank you again for being here. Um, so, as Michelle mentioned, I want to share with you all a project that we've been working on with the Black Wealth Data Center. Uh, from the title of the session, you can probably uh, guess that we really wanted to understand sort of what business data exists in Connecticut, as well as how we can identify minority-owned and black-owned businesses. And then through our analysis and discussions, I want to share some of the data gaps we've encountered um, through our discussions. So when thinking about data sources that we could look at, um, the first one that came to mind was the SOTS data, the Secretary of the State data. And so this is a, a pretty incredible database of all businesses that are required to register with the state. 
Um, and this is you know, a very recent data, and it's a great data source for Connecticut businesses in particular. So this was naturally our first choice. We also wanted to supplement the SOTS data with data from the Small Business uh, Administration, um, specifically the PPP loan data set. Um, this has data for dispersed loan amounts collected um, between April of 2020 and May of 2021. So it's about 14 months of data. Now before I get into sort of how we merged and linked the data sets, I want to give you a little breakdown of each data set. So as I mentioned previously, the SOTS data uh, has all of the businesses that exist in Connecticut that are required to register with the state. So this includes uh, any corporations, LLCs, LLPs, uh, probably a couple more, but not sole proprietorships. So in this data set, there are about 550,000 different businesses, about uh, two thirds of which are currently active. And so inactive businesses still remain in the data set. And as Michelle mentioned, in 2018, uh, SOTS introduced the minority owned question, um, but unfortunately, business owners are not able to designate a specific race or ethnicity. And then one other thing I want to mention is that this data is updated weekly, and so our analysis goes through Q1 of 2023. Now in terms of the PPP data set, um, this was collected from April of 2020 when the program started through May of 2021 when it ended. And so this data set has 100, about 120,000 records for Connecticut. Um, note that these aren't necessarily 120,000 businesses as each business could have applied for more than one loan. So it's the count of all the loans that occurred. And the great thing about this data set is, and why we wanted to pull it in, is that it does have race and ethnicity data. And so I think the biggest takeaway is that we wanted to use that race and ethnicity data from the PPP data set to supplement our analysis uh, with the SOTS data to really understand the racial characteristics of business owners in Connecticut. So before I go into the actual data um, analysis, I wanted to really quickly touch on the you know, coverage rates for res uh, the response rates for both the minority owned questions and the race and ethnicity questions in both surveys. And so for the SOTS data set, about one in five business owners identified as minority owned. And this is uh, from 2020 to 2021. In comparison, uh, the PPP data set collected data not only on race, but also ethnicity as two separate fields. And so you can see that about one in four uh, business owners who are in the PPP data set actually specified their race. And so the other 75 or 76% left that field blank. Uh, it's pretty similar with ethnicity too. So you can see that the response rates are pretty low. And it's important to know that this isn't really an apples to apples comparison because the other 81% of businesses um, in the SOTS data set that are coded as not minority owned could have either indicated that on the form or they could have skipped the question. And so both of those scenarios um, are reported as not minority owned. And so because of that, it's really difficult to understand the you know, landscape of Connecticut businesses, even from just a minority owned standpoint. Um, so as you can see, uh, the minority owned question was introduced in 2018. So from 2000 to 2018, about an average of 4% of businesses identified as minority owned. Whereas from 2018 through the end of Q1 of 2023, the average jumped to about 20, uh, I'm sorry, 17%. And so this jump could mean one of two things, right? One, there are actually more minor, minority owned businesses opening in Connecticut. Or two, more likely, is that because this question was introduced in 2018, businesses that started before 2018 didn't actually have the opportunity to make that designation. And so one of the only ways they can do that is by updating uh, that field during their annual report submission. And it's very likely that a lot of businesses, even minority owned businesses, just haven't done that yet. 
So now that we've talked about the two data sets separately, I want to give you a brief overview of how we sort of link the data sets. So we started with all of the records from both data sets. And um, a very talented data scientist at the Black Wealth Data Center, Ami, applied, <laughs> applied, she's very talented, very smart. Uh, um, but she applied this, what's called a fuzzy matching algorithm, which basically looked at the company name from both data sets, along with geographic attributes such as uh, the town and zip code of the company. Um, and without going too much into the methodology, we ended up with 44,000 matches, so 44,000 um, links between both data sets. Now of these 44,000 matches, we found that only 10,000 provided race and ethnicity, race, uh, sorry, not ethnicity, just race data. And so the other 34,000 left that field blank. And so this is a very low response rate, as I've already mentioned previously. Now of these 10,000, only about 6% or 593 identified as black owned. And then the most interesting part is that of these 593 businesses, only 57% of them identified as minority owned in the SOTS data set. And so this is a huge data gap because when we were linking the data, our expectation was most of the people who identified as black owned in the PPP data set would have identified as minority owned in the SOTS data set. But the data shows that 43% of these business owners did not make that designation. Um, I am not sure why this is, and it's you know definitely something that we want to investigate further, but it, it is a huge data gap and definitely something that we didn't expect. So with the 44,000 linked records, we also wanted to look at businesses that opened uh, between 2018 and Q1 of 2023, and those that closed as well. And what we found was that almost one in two black-owned businesses opened between 2018 and 2023 are inactive as of uh, March 31st of this year. Now, it's important to note that because the response rates for the race question were so low, our sample size of black owned businesses was only 168. And so for any sort of data analysis purposes, we do want a larger sample size to be more confident. But this uh, brings me back to a conversation uh, we had with, I think, uh, Oni brought it up a few weeks ago where he mentioned that black women are becoming more and more likely to open their own businesses, but at the same time, they don't have the support they need to keep them running long term. And so while we weren't able to break this data down by black owned and women owned, um, just looking at the black owned data, it's really apparent that we do have to start investing in our black owned businesses. Now, because the linked data was not as rich as we had hoped due to all the missing data, I wanted to dive a little bit into just the PPP data. So looking at all 120,000 records instead of just the 44,000 linked records. The first thing we found was that there was a huge difference in the uh, approved loan amounts by race. And so as you can see, black or African-American business owners received the lowest uh, PPP loan out of any of the other race groups. Now, without any additional data or context, it's really hard to make conclusions, but you know, there is obviously a huge disparity there when you know, white business owners received over three times the amount that black business owners did. And you know, this is something, I, I don't really have the background in this, but I'm hoping one of our panelists um, can share some insight into why this might be. Great. Um, and then for those who don't know, the PPP loans were dispersed in two different rounds. So um, a business could apply for a first round loan and if they were accepted, they were given the money. And then after that, they would be able to apply for a second round loan with stricter requirements. And so what we found was from the first round to the second round, Black, bis black or African business owners saw the largest decrease in approved and dispersed loans. So you can see it was about 76% less for black or African American business owners compared to um, the rest of the other race groups. And 
similar to the previous slide, without any additional data or context, it's really hard to draw any conclusions. But this is definitely a disparity that we want to explore further. So I, I hope that you know these findings have set the stage for the rest of this session, uh, where uh, Nelly, Oni, and Harry will sort of talk about these findings and implications through more of a policy perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, as you all can see, we have a lot of work to do, right, to understand our black-owned businesses um, in the state. So um, Jason did present on the many challenges that exist with the public data that we have available. Um, and we really don't know the universe of black-owned businesses, nor do we know how many were started by women versus black men. So what has, if you guys could all speak on what the impact of that has on your work as you try and assist um, black-owned businesses. bring awareness uh, to their businesses and what they do in their locations. Uh, we're a fully volunteer uh, organization, don't take any payments for the work that we do. Um, about, uh, it was February, so Black History Month, right? And I received an email from several directors from the SBA, and they wanted to do a black business walk in Connecticut, and they did not know where to do it. <laughs> and. You know, in our conversations that I've been having with this lovely group over the last few weeks, uh, I've just been pondering how that can be possible, where you have a director and a deputy director who's in charge of an entire state's small business population and have no clue where to even start to visit black businesses during Black History Month. And so if that alone doesn't tell you the level uh, of this issue and where we're at, I don't know what else uh, can tell you. And so when we talk about the gaps and the impact uh, of these gaps, it's it's bottom up and it, it's top down. And, and I'll probably touch on this a little bit later, but I, I wanna give you guys a chance to add some context to this answer as well. So I don't think any of you will be surprised by some of my answers. Um, <laughs> what resonates for me is it's, there's a collection challenge and there's a definition challenge. So, and we could have a whole nother conference on data collection practices, right? There's this reliance on surveys. And what I challenge and what I believe is that it's not that the data is not out there, it's that the data is not available for the conversation. So how do we build the partnerships? How do we build the relationships? How do, I, how do we identify, and that's what I'll speak to a little bit in, in my presentation, is you can't tell a whole story because the data's not there. And, and the data can't, it, well, let me change that, because the data's not a part of the story. I challenge you that the data's there. Even during the conversations that we had in preparation for this, one of the data sets that we crave is from Crunchbase, and we found out that you had access to it, but we don't. So how can we build the relationships necessary to get that data out there? Some of the data sources we have aren't data sources that you have to pay for. None of them are. We've paid for nothing. It is all data that's out there, but we don't make it a part of the conversation. The second thing I would challenge is the definition of small business because I don't think it's representative, especially when you start to think about what minority small businesses are. Are we talking about sole proprietorships? Are we talking about LLCs? If you look at the SBA definition of small business, it's what a million plus counts as a small business. You can, you can walk into multiple franchise opportunities and they will count as small businesses, but they aren't and their needs are different. So I would challenge that as we think about how we shape the narrative around small business, minority-owned business, black business ownership as a wealth-building tool, we need to get really clear around who we're trying to help and who they are. 
because it's not clear right now. And we don't have the data. The one thing that we are boggled by is SBA, US SBA, one of the largest issuers of loans, done shared data disaggregated by race. We actually have no idea how many black owned businesses get 704 loans. We have no idea how many of those businesses are sustainable after X number of years. So how do we make sure we have the infrastructure to be able to support them, as Harry's talking about, if we don't even know who they are? I appreciate y'all setting it off crazy. Okay. Um, uh, um, so I think there are two things I want to touch on. Um, one is around uh, narrative, and the other is around infrastructure. So, you know, from my perspective, and CT Next, we're a quasi state agency really here to support entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, primarily, our focus is on what we call innovation driven enterprises. So, intellectual property coming out of higher education that's going to be commercialized or venture backable companies. Um, but for a number of reasons, we also work with the small business ecosystem, especially as we think about building equity in our entrepreneurial ecosystems. I think the more we can organize the quote unquote small business ecosystem, then we can create pathways to a lot of the innovation driven enterprises and innovation driven ecosystems that we're trying to build here in the state. So, you know, on the narrative side, I think what's really fascinating to me is a lot of issues I see within our entrepreneurial ecosystem, I see in institutions across the country. But for example, I'll use the, our education institution. So, me having gone through public school my whole life, there are a number of teachers who said, Oni, I'm really excited to see your full development as a potential C plus student. So, and the same thing are happening with our businesses, our black owned businesses. Yeah, you can create a barber shop, you can create a restaurant, you can create something that we feel is up to your potential, which is a lot less than we're telling other people what they can do. And because of that narrative, and because there's a lack of data to show how we're under invested in and over mentored, we also on the same time have people saying, Ah, yeah, we try to invest in more black owned businesses as VCs, but they just don't have what it takes to get us our returns. So because we're positioned in this small business, like our, our highest ability is to create a quote unquote small business, we're inherently and culturally not being able to explore the opportunities for us to build hardware, to build technology, and really be on the cover of Forbes as the next billion dollar business owners. From an infrastructure standpoint, there's also this side of it of saying, to everyone's point, how are we deploying funding and how are we creating financial products that have the ability to fill what's called the friends and family round? Knowing the lack of black wealth in communities, it's hard to go ask the cousins at the, at the cookout for 100K. That's just a difficult conversation to have because folks just don't have that. But then as a VC, folks come in and they say, mm, we don't cut checks that small, or uh, they should be able to magnetize resources to get those initial dollars in. Well, if those dollars aren't there in our communities, then how are we get, and if folks aren't trying to invest in our communities for us to attain that wealth to invest in ourselves, what real treadmill are you putting us on? And I think oftentimes with black owned business and the infrastructure that's aimed to support them they're more excited to put folks through a bunch of incubators and accelerators rather than give them a dollar. So we have a lot of businesses that are over mentored and under invested in. And because of that, we have people confusing movement with progress. Yeah, I, I think uh, if, ever, if, everyone can, if everyone can remember the slide that we went back to where it looked at businesses that were clearly black owned but didn't put that they were black owned, didn't put that they were minority owned. And, and I think we're starting, and I, and I know the answer, but I hope you guys are starting to put the answer as to why somebody would do that, right? It's, it's not just about funding, it's not just about resources. It, there's a bigger picture in what's going on here, and at least uh, for Shop Black CT, part of 
uh, you know, sometimes when we collect, we talk about data, right? We're talking about numbers, and we sometimes forget that there's something on the other end of those numbers. And so with Shop Black CT, the way that we collect the data is directly from the businesses starting that relationship right from the ground zero, building that trust. And so um, that's another, again, something to, to look at for some of our broader organizations is, okay, cool, you have a data set, but do you know who that data set represents? Do you have any sort of connection to them? Because those are the things that help build confidence, help build your perception of self as a business owner. And, and as Oni, he always talks about the barbershop to, you could have a string of barbershops, right? Like nobody's saying that there's nothing wrong with the barbershop, but it's the mentality that you're a black man, you can only run one barbershop, but you can't run a hundred, you can't run a thousand, what's up? I don't think I'll have nearly as much to say as these folks, but uh, not in a bad way. Uh, but you know, as a data analyst, my job is to you know pull messy data from somewhere, clean it, analyze it, and tell a story. And so when there are these data gaps, I can't do my work well enough to provide these really intelligent people with. Uh, data to help them make decisions, to help them change policies. And so, you know, these data gaps, you know, start from the level of, of you know, the work that I do, and then they persist through, you know, policy change as well. And so, you know, from my standpoint, it's really, really important to have these get data gaps be patched so that the final product that I can deliver to these folks um, is high quality and will actually help them make decisions. And you led into my next question, Jason. <laughs> Very nice setup there. Um, so I was interested in hearing um, some examples of how policy or programs that you're trying to implement are challenged because you don't have the data to support the policy or program. Who would like to start? Uh, and so uh, one of uh, the many hats uh, that I wear is uh, an elected official, um, and so I sit on the town council in East Hartford, and of course we were awarded uh, millions of dollars of ARPA funds. And so uh, initially, uh, as a council, we sat down, and a few of us were very hyper-focused uh, on this and very hyper-focused on communities that have a limited voice uh, in the higher ends of government. and so. We pushed to allocate about $4.5 million to our small businesses. However, and I hope nobody, okay, nobody's in here. All right, I think. <laughs> I, 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 it's a program that we put out, but it, there's, there were a lot of issues, and part of it was we didn't have the data to let us know about how many women owned businesses, how many black owned businesses, how many minority owned businesses are in our community and what their status was, right? Like, um, you know, what, what is their, you know, wh how much money do they bring in, right? Like what resources are they already using and, and what's their trajectory? And so when, we, and I was, me and another colleague were putting forth some plans about, you know, how to allocate the money that we just didn't have any of the data to actually put forth in front of uh, the, the mayor's office and the rest of the directors to say that we need to target some of this money even more specifically beyond the broader small businesses and focus on certain minority and women owned businesses throughout our town that are struggling. We didn't have access to that data and unfortunately at the end of the day a majority of the companies that got the money were well established companies that have been there a while. They had all of the resources to complete the paperwork. They had the financial uh, vitality that showed that they knew how to use the money for the loan. And the number of reports I kept hearing about applications being turned down or being turned in incomplete, like I, I was going crazy. I was in the development director's office. I was skipping work to go and, and ask questions and go say, go to the Chamber of Commerce, see what's going on. But if I just had that data set from the start, I would have been able to justify a much more impactful and holistic program. So, you know, I, I, I look at that as, as one of the, the failures of, of my, my uh, political career, but uh, coming into this group and having these conversations is really letting me know that, that a data gap played a significant role in that. And, and what could we have done differently with that four and a half million dollars over, you know, a, a year and a half is, is something that 
you know, you, I can only dream about. So there's huh, so many. Um, so to, to, I'll say two things. One, to reiterate what Harry was talking about, the point of data is to tell a story. And it's irresponsible to tell that story if you don't have enough data. Like, how can you really tell a story about a whole community if you only have 5% of the data necessary to tell that story? So when you don't have that data, you cannot tell that story. So gap is, you just don't know. Because even if we can't do anything with little bits of data, if you really want to tell a broader story. The second part is, it's so easy to blame individuals for things that are not happening. It's so easy to say, well, the inequities are happening because there's not enough training, there's not enough incubators, there's not enough mentors. Black people just don't know how to start businesses. So let's just put them through all these things. It's easy to do that when the people who have the data to highlight the systemic barriers and the systemic issues aren't sharing that data. So how can we say it's an infrastructure problem? How can we say that access to capital is an issue if we don't have the data that shows that we're not getting the friends and family, we're not getting the investments? Let's face it, black topics are get 15 minutes of fame after something has happened. And we're starting to get our last minute. Nobody's really, you know, we're not talking about George Floyd anymore. Now we're seeing philanthropic organizations and VCs be less interested in black wealth and black businesses, and now it's racial. Now it's minority. And that's because the data's not there to distinguish what is happening at the community level. That's why you have to push for your legislatures, push for your government to share out the data that helps us understand the systemic issues. So when organizations like mine want to be able to tell that story through visualizations, we can. Because at the moment, similar to what Harry was, um, sorry, similar to what Jason was talking about, if you look at our business ownership page, it's very, gen it, it's generic. We can't tell the story because we don't have enough data to tell it responsibly. And I'm not gonna put some stuff out there that isn't sound. Um, you know, I think one thing I go back to a lot is who listens to what story and what data? You know, I, if I get a hundred entrepreneurs in the room, black entrepreneurs, and I say, how are y'all getting money? And they're like, ah, it's struggle. I bring that to a legislative official. I bring that to someone making decisions, gatekeepers, what have you. And I'm like, hey, I just like, talk to folks and they said they're not getting money well that's anecdotal we don't really have the you know what i mean it's, oh, okay you know so i think for me it's it's so insidious because we're not like the lived experience is not good enough for folks the struggle i, I used to own and operate a coffee roasting company and coffee shop the struggles i had folks don't want to listen to unless it's presented to them in a certain way and we don't have the tools to present it to them in that certain way. So what are we gonna, it's a catch 22, right? You're not gonna listen to me as I cry, beg and plead about what resources I need because it's not packaged to you in a white paper and I don't have the resources and, and data sets to give it to you in the white paper that can actually make a lot of sense and change the narrative. So that's i think huge for us and and kind of going back to earlier point you know when the first days i got to this job i realized that there's a ton of money coming into connecticut for you know inflation reduction act chips american rescue plan ssbci from treasury small business something 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 um and i knew that the Biden administration is saying, okay, we need to aggregate for race. We need to start investing in black people and underrepresented founders or SETI, social income disadvantaged individuals. So I go to PitchBook, which is one of the largest kind of um, CRMs. Yeah, crunch based input, yeah. Um, I go to PitchBook and I email them and I'm like, hey, how many 
black-owned businesses in Connecticut have received venture capital funding in the last decade? And they're like, oh, we don't have that. I'm like, why? Like, what? right? So they're not even holding this information in order for me to go to folks and say, with Treasury pouring millions of dollars into the state, here's why we need to allocate it for the next generation of black or underrepresented business owners, because historically, we've only seen X amount of dollars outside of the X plus amount of dollars that's come to these individuals. So for me, it's really about as we try, as CT Next tries to build out more initiatives, I feel myself going more and more on an island because I can't speak the data language of the folks in power to be able to warrant why I want to invest in black community. Right, and that to me is very much a struggle. Can my organization feel too black because of the initiatives that we're running, and I don't have the data to show why these initiatives, or I think the United States has lost a trillion dollars in economic value by not investing in black entrepreneurs. But what does that mean for the state of Connecticut? I don't have the data to show. Okay, so, um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, so we have, you know, Five, well, actually we have 15 minutes left and really what um, I'd, like to, I'd like to hear, um, thinking about how we can take these challenges, right, and, and, and make a difference, and change, right? Um, and I think, Natalie, you talked about this act data for action and actionable data. And so how, how do you see us getting there, right? We, we need to, like, we clearly have a gap, we clearly have a challenge, we're not serving a community of black business owners. And so how do we um, bridge this gap? <laughs> to be cliche, to, uh, yeah, right? Um, because we need to, right? Um, we're losing economic output in the state. We're you know, leaving a whole class, you know, whole group of business owners behind by not investing. So have you guys thought about this? I know, Natalie, you've thought a lot about it, right? <laughs> so I'd love to hear um, how we can fill these gaps. Sure. Yeah. I feel like you're going to end it. <laughs> uh, you're the closer over here. Right? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll simply just say from, uh, from the Shop Black CT perspective, right, where we're boots on the ground in front of these businesses, developing relationships and promoting them, I think one thing that I've really been thinking about today, and it's a thought that hasn't left my head, is that how aware are black business owners about this issue? Because when I think about where the best outcomes come from, right? Like I work in healthcare and I drive quality improvement for an organization, right? And, and you wanna look at how to improve outcomes, right? And you've got extrinsic motivation, you've got intrinsic motivation, right? And I think that the more that we engage our black business owners, the more that they can feel empowered, uh, and then the more that they can um, advocate for themselves as well, right? So, so we're all here like-minded and we're advocating for them as well, but it's even more powerful when you have the people who are behind the work that we're doing also advocating. They're all they're people who are registered voters, right? Like they have uh, political uh, power to be able to elect people who are putting forward initiatives that are going to support them. They have the ability to go to the state legislator, go to the LOB and sit in on these committees and, and make their voice heard. But are they aware of the issue and, and how can we better communicate to them these data gaps and, and when they're filling out uh, uh, applications and, and surveys to, to make sure that they're, they're proud and they feel uh, confident in putting that they're a minority or they're a black owned business. And so I think it's, it's uh, engagement of the people that we're looking to support, uh, especially around uh, data and, and improving data literacy amongst that population. Yeah, facts. Um, I think, so for me, there's a couple things. I think CT Next, Department of Economic Community Development, 
Advanced CT, who's a sponsor, um, Kinetic Innovations. We all need to have the same front door, and this is Kate, our Data Insights Manager at CT Next, something we were just talking about today. Like, we really need to have, we need to be asking our businesses the same questions so we have the same amount of data that we can compare and contrast. And then do a lot more to understand the ecosystem of resources and how they flow through and where folks, again, no pun intended, are falling through the gaps. I think that's a big one. I think the second one, you know, to Harry's point, 1,900 businesses shot black CT? 1,800? That's a voting block. And 1,800 business owners going to the, their state legislatures, going to their local leaders, and asking, hey, you know, Connecticut Innovations is launching a $50 million investment arm for underrepresented founders. Are they gonna invest in people of color or women? Or women of color? Like, how are we really understanding what dollars are available and how they're gonna flow? And I think the lack of education about the resources is by design. You know, I can talk about the infrastructure. You know, oh gosh, I'll get me in trouble. Yo, <laughs> I'll, I'll say this one thing. So I was in a room, there's like, there's organization, well, DCD put out some dollars and I had the, the privilege of kind of being in the room to see how these dollars are allocated. And this was supposed to help underrepresented entrepreneurs, um, entrepreneurs of color and underrepresented entrepreneurs uh, get access to federal funds. And a lot of incubators and accelerators and CDFIs and kind of uh, organizations to distribute great money applied. And in it, they had to say, how are you going to market to underrepresented communities and communities of color? And a lot of them said they're gonna work with the same five kind of top marketing agencies in the state of Connecticut. And looking at the staff section of those agencies, there's not one person of color on any of those teams. So Again, it's the, it, it's the ecosystem that we're operating in. You can't ask a, a marketing team, no matter how amazing they are, to market to the black community if they don't even know where they are, their interests are, where they look to, right? It's just gonna be Facebook ad buys that say oh, African Americans in Hartford. And that's really not going to, and honoring them in the way that they deserve. So I think it's about, from the state perspective, really doing a better job of having a clear and clear front door where we're actively trying to get that data to make decisions. And then from an ecosystem perspective, we need to start reimagining not only who's getting checks, but who has authority to cut checks in the state, right? Who's that, who, who, how are we building the infrastructure for the next generation of black and brown known wraparound entrepreneurship services that can really help tailor the entrepreneurs that we serve and show them that they deserve to be in the A plus category of businesses. I want. I just. I wanted to give um, Jason a chance to say how CT data could help um, with actionable data. So I would say that, so as a state data center, we have a uh, lot of partnerships across the state and we work with a lot of different state agencies. And so I think the, the best thing we can do is, you know, you know, talk to people. So we have talked um, to our partners at SOTS about the business data. And we actually learned that the business data in their system, um, the minority owned responses are actually separated by unanswered, not minority owned and minority owned. But in the way that they're currently reporting it, those, la those uh, other two groups are grouped into not minority owned. And so even if they were to report the data with those three categories, we would be able to look at, you know, of the businesses that re reported, uh, that provided minority owned data, how many were actually minority owned, whereas now, the minority owned numbers like 19% in Connecticut that is you know understated because that includes all of those extraneous responses where people skip the the question and so you know apart from that i think that 
it's important for us to have conversations with you know everyone here whether it's through a conference or our equity community of practice to really uh, you know get the data out there because before working on this presentation and this project with the Black Wealth Data Center, I, you know, I had no idea how large the gap was. And so just having these conversations with our partners and you know, data users across the state, um, I think is you know, one of our critical roles in this process. All right, and then now we can wrap it up. Oh my God. <laughs> so everything they said. <laughs> um, I think if I were gonna if I were gonna organize my thoughts around this, there's 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 like three phases to driving change in my mind. There's awareness, there's activation, and then there's institutionalization. So when you think about how do you address data gaps, it, it's not framing it from a how do you address data gaps. It's framing it from a what are the things we don't know. And so what are those questions that we want to be able to answer? Like, how many businesses that started during COVID still exist? And what did it take for them to continue to exist? And what were the conditions where the ones failed? And how are they doing now? Because business ownership is just a stage, right? The ultimate goal is intergenerational wealth. So business ownership is a tool to get to an ultimate goal. So the first question, that, so the first step to that is understanding what are the questions that you have that gets to addressing wealth and equity that you can't answer today? And then once you have that awareness, once you have that understanding of those questions, then you're able to build awareness around what data is out there that isn't a part of the conversation, that is a part of the conversation, and then just that doesn't exist because we haven't even talked about private sector data. I had a conversation out in the lobby. I give more information to Google than I give to any government organization. Google knows more about me than I know about me. How do we think about where the data lives? Because if we have that understanding, then when it's time to start activating, we have some methods for activating. It's so easy as data people or as people who want to solve problems in the space to immediately go to, I'm going to do a survey. I'm going to ask the people. I'm going to hold a conversation. But I challenge that if we move out of this space of data deficit and realize that there is an abundance of data out there that needs to be unlocked, then we can start to move the needle on addressing the gaps. Because I challenge that the gap isn't there because there isn't enough data or that the data isn't collected. I'd say we over collect in many spaces. And that the answer is actually who, the question that we need to ask in that activation space is who has the data? Who has it? Who's already collecting it and using it to make money? Who's already collecting it and using it to build their next product? Somebody has the data, we just have to find it. And there's an ecosystem, a wealth of people who you just have to ask the question to. Now, I'm not naive. There's some people that are gonna go, no, you gotta pay me six figures to get it. And then that's when you call on your legislation or you call on somebody else and you activate them because you say, I need this data to answer this question that you want answered in order for you to drive impact. Data is a bridge. It is never the final answer. And as long as we always stay focused on data being the bridge and you stay focused on the answer you're ultimately trying to get to, the gaps can be solved. And then as you do this, the institutionalization happens with policy change. That's what we talked about this morning, right? Like the ways that you unlock data as an actionable asset happens through governance, happens through legislation, happens through policy change. But I have never met a legislature that was just gonna change policy because you asked. You have to show it, you have to prove it, you have to show that this data that you collect is so invaluable to all of these other things that you need for your platform and to show that you care to get more votes later that you need to put some legislation in place to unlock it. How do we bring private sector organizations more into the conversation? They have the data promise you. 
promise you, they have it. We want to know more about homelessness? Go to the realtor organizations. They have the data. Go to the financial institutions. They have the data. They got everything. <laughs> they have it. It just, there needs to be a motivation and pressure on both sides. So this is where you get into collect, sorry, I'm now preaching, but like this is where you get to collective impact and why when you bring together the right voices and you follow that build awareness, activate, institutionalize, you do it for one, you do it for 10, you do it for 50, and now you got something you can scale. My job. That was great. Yeah, a lot to think about there. So thank you, Natalie. And thank you to our other panelists. Now is it time to open it up to, for questions, audience questions. If you wouldn't mind, go um, to the mic just so we can, for the recording. Thank you very much, very interesting discussion. Uh, I get the feeling that data is used as a panacea for business success. It's not so. For healthcare, yes, because I can show the data to a clinical person, a physician, public health worker, and we can have remedies. But in the world of business, it's different. Many of these public programs are run by people who have never spent a day inside of corporations. Yes, they have run coffee shops. Yes, they have run nonprofits here and so on. But never a tech, tech company or anything like that where you have to sit and code all night. Okay, that's number one. Number two is, even if you have the data and failure, you can, it's not easily remediable. I'll give you concrete examples. $6.3 million was allocated to Hartford tech startups. $6.3 million. Before COVID hit, $4.4 million went to 76, seven, six tech startups from out of state, out of which 31 were from foreign countries. Okay. Not one Hartford tech startup was participating in any of the $6.4 million accelerator programs. That's number one. Number two, even a basic website that was this program put together, uh, launch Hartford, I think they call themselves today. $150,000 for a website. It went, it did not even go for bidding, it went to a New Haven company. The following year, another $150,000 went to a New Haven company without any bidding. That's $300,000 for a godforsaken website. People are mad because there are hundreds of website developments in Hartford itself. That money should have stayed in Hartford. This is data. You give it to the people, they look the other way, or they're scared to act on it. So data is not a panacea in the world of business development. I, I literally work with minority tech startup guys. I have guys in blockchain and everything else. So you have to be very cognizant on how you're going to use data. I know minority, I, he literally moved out of state. He moved to Atlanta. I know another minority who went to New York and another one who went to New Jersey. They didn't want to deal with this. So we do, need to be very cognizant about how data is used, and especially at the state level. Now, the remedy to this, very simply, is now that we have federal dollars in the mix. So you get the federal government, let the federal government know how their dollars are being used. And that is what I've done. I had to go to the Department of Justice and federal agencies to get, I want a level playing field. Do you mind I've, if I, can I pause you real quick? Okay, let me finish this, and Hold then on. you could, I would love to have your response. Okay. All I want is a level playing field. I'm not asking for extra million dollars from you. In fact, I won't even apply for a dollar from you. My clients would may want money from you, but we want a level playing field, and this has been going for over 20 years. And the past six years, it has been blatantly offset. COVID changed that. I mean, people literally lost their lives and livelihoods over this issue. God. Data is not a panacea in business. Please. Okay. So I'm going gonna, gonna to address one thing, and I'm not sure what the question was in that. And then he's the money guy, so he'll answer the, he'll answer the money part. I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, so I will say data is not a panacea. Data is a bridge, and I think that's what we've all set up here, that the people who make the change, the th that change happens with the people. That's it. Data has always been used as an information resource. 
and how people use that information resource is where we get into and activate change. So I can't speak to none of the data you just spoke to because I'm not from Connecticut. I also can't speak to how people, in, uh, uh not arguing, so also can't speak to how that data has been interpreted to make decisions, but what I can say is in your ecosystem and your sphere of making change, you can use data to build awareness, to activate people, and to ultimately drive change. That's all I think we as okay. panelists no, are trying to say yeah, up here. You're stating the obvious. I'll give you another example. No, no, we're good. A, mil a, yeah, million, a million dollars. question. Yes, I have a question. Yeah, a million dollars question. went to a foreign startup and, the, and what he what he did yeah, was Chris, you can just, he hired one you can person just here in. and and twelve yeah. and twelve person in another country. Yes, they, we we need more actionable data. Yeah. Even if we have that, yeah. even if we have that. Thank you. For, we really to need to address. get to the next question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank yeah. you so uh, much. No, I'm I'm doing a level playing field. I'm working with the federal government to resolve this. Thank, thank you. you so much, Chris. What's up, buddy? Hi, thank you. <laughs> yes, it's, it's a, a sort of a kind of maybe a two-part question. And one of it is I think you touched on a lot of this, but it's about whether or not administrative data is really the best way to identify some of these businesses and their needs. Because, you know, uh, the nonprofit that I work with, about 80% of our staff are minority, and I can tell you that almost all of them are business owners. Uh, they all have a side hustle. There's no shortage of entrepreneurial spirit and interest. And the amount of times during the day, especially as a technology person, like, you know, you can make a business out of that that I hear on a regular basis. So, um, you know, there's one of the slides that showed how many the reapplications of the reapplications for that money was rejected. And my question about relating to the administrative data is, what are some other ways to maybe build that trust in the system that has discriminated against, especially minority businesses for so long, um, to rebuild that trust and and whether or not there's an alternative to the administrative data, because I think Harry has the answer. Yeah, no, Chris, thank you. And uh, the SBA has been consulting with me on that kind of exact question, right, is they have these resources, but they lack, I think, uh, we're going to say the word bridge again, but they lack the relationship, right? And so, um, and again, going back to the small business program that we did in East Hartford, right, and they they were overwhelmed by the administrative um, kind of pieces to uh, the, uh, the grant program. And so I think for us is that we need to take a step back and be really intentional about the work we want to do. If we're saying we want to support uh, black businesses in our community, we need to understand what that means, right? It's not just put out a communication piece and I'm done. It's not just secure some funding and connect them and I'm done. It's a, it's a intensive, it's a holistic process. Again, we're dealing with, uh, and, and I was having a conversation earlier, um, you know, when we talk about legacies, right? Um, not so long ago, there may be people in this room who were alive back when black people couldn't attend certain colleges, most colleges. We couldn't attend medical schools. We couldn't attend law schools. and so. We are competing against generations of people who have an understanding of the landscape, not only current day, but from the very start, and have the, the cumulative resources from that start to then support what they're doing today. And so when we're looking at when people coming in, and we're talking about a level playing field, um, it's that it's that information, there's also an information and, and educational gap, right? And, and I think we really need to, uh, we need to address that as soon as possible. I think we're getting to a point in time where if we don't address it, uh, the gap is gonna get insurmountable. Um, and, and this is something I'm, I'm super passionate about is this, you know, financial literacy and health literacy and, you know, just educational literacy, just the understanding of the basic systems that lead to success. Yeah, well, thank you so much for the presentation. The panel's been wonderful. Um, I love the idea of this awareness particularly among the black community and black businesses. I'm a sole proprietor, I'm a psychologist by training, but I morphed into a program evaluation business because the Congressional Black Caucus did something called the Minority AIDS Initiative that was, um, came, came about through the AIDS crisis. And they 
sent money to community-based agencies, and those community-based agencies needed data. Um, but it, it became one of the biggest funders through HHS. This was an, an infrastructure change that sort of changed the course for many nonprofit minority um, 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 businesses. Um, so I think the awareness and maybe you redefining what is a black business and making that awareness more known in the black community so that the black community itself can advocate for its own businesses would be, and I, I just want to know what your ideas are, are about redefining the definition of black businesses. Uh, before anyone answers that, I do have to present at another session, so just thank you everyone, and it was... <laughs> popular, yes. Uh, it, was, it was an honor to be sitting here with you folks, so thank you everyone. Thank you, and we always talk about data, but you need the people to do the analysis on the data, or it's just going to be a bunch of numbers. Um, and so uh, when we're talking about, uh, I think, d defining uh, black businesses, I think that just in the way that it's said, it, I think you touched on this, it, it almost feels like it's a, it's a fleeting thing, like it's a flavor of the month, right? Like, oh, now we're going to focus on you guys, but... Uh, once we've kind of exhausted enough resources, we're going to move on. I think that it needs to become more of a commonplace conversation, and it needs to not just be kind of aligned with ODI conversations. Like, it really needs to be built in into a number of different conversations that, that go completely outside of just data. And so um, I, I think that not only in defining the you know, the black business, I, I just think black identity in and of itself, it's, it's a whole nother conversation that, that needs uh, attention additionally. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, oh man, I could, I, could, I could talk a lot, but you know, when, when we look at, at some of the data that we've looked at and you consistently see, you know, blacks at, at the bottom, right? It, medium income, you know, uh, getting degrees, business ownership. I think um, the, the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives has said that, you know, among business ownership in the United States, I think blacks own about 2.2% of businesses, but we're over 14% of the population, right? Like, things like that, right? And, and so, again, back to just these conversations, right? And, and I think the more that we come together as data-minded people, because remember, not everyone is comfortable with data and understands it, and as soon as it's introduced, they'll push you back and you lose them. So I think that as us data-minded folks come together more and have this conversation and get to, um, get to a common ground, and then I think we, we then push that common ground out and, and spread it. Uh, similarly, uh, to the census conversation as well, right? I think that that's an important conversation. I think that those who have the skill sets and the wherewithal and the understanding really need to prioritize coming together and coming with a standardized way to approach how we look at data the same way that I think there needs to be a, a more standardized way that we approach business data around uh, black and brown business uh, ownership. I think the only thing I would add is there are a lot of organizations, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are organizations out there who put all of their energy into these topics and they don't necessarily have the resources that they need to fully participate in the conversation. Harry's organization is one. <laughs> so what I've seen over the last five plus years is that because there's this recognition of a lack of awareness and understanding around black owned businesses, there's been these organizations that have come together to bring that community together and then amplify their work. So I think about um, Harry's organization, I think about you know Buy Black Business Day and the amplification then. I think about um, what, what's been popping into my head is, and I'm, I'm diverting topics at the moment, um, Back in, I think, the 2010 census is when the conversation around like race 
and ethnicity and lack of representation in census really started to, to come to head. And the result of that is there was a nonprofit that was formed called the Black Census. And so it's an organization who actively goes out and collects data from black households and individuals. The reason I bring that up is part of the challenge with even collecting data, and we haven't really talked about this, but part of the challenge with collecting and getting the data that we need is trust. Some people don't trust people that don't look like them. Some people don't trust to give their data to organizations face to face that don't have community minded intentions. So we have to think about as we think about how do we get the data that we need? How do we address some of these gaps? How do we influence the ways that money and resources are allocated? We have to think about there is a trust factor in all of this. Because as I said during my keynote, data is people. And if the people don't trust, the people are not going to give up their data. Oh, and, and just to add to that, um, historically, right, when we have, uh, as a community, provided that data and let the general public know this is a center of black wealth and excellence, we have seen historically what has happened to those locations as they are no longer here. And so when we talk about the confidence and the definitions uh, and the apprehension, right? It's, it's based in, in real things that have actually happened. And I think that there's a lot of people who ignore the reality behind the experience. And so when you come face to face with somebody who's a black business owner and you're denying their loan because uh, you don't really have all the paperwork and things like that, you're only seeing them right there. You're not seeing through to the full broad context of what that experience means and what it even takes for that person to even be in front of you asking for a loan for a business that they probably put their whole life on the line to put together, right? Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> we ran over a little bit, but that was, I, it, that was a great conversation. You gave us so much to think about. Um, so thank you to our panelists, Oni, Natalie, and Harry for your time, expertise, and insights. This was great. Um, so now we need to beware, activate, and institutionalize. So <laughs> All right, so onward.